Yeah, it's like evening. Memor- quite a beautiful memorable Sunday evening. evening. It was memorable. And, uh, it's gorgeous out, so kudos to you for coming today uh, uh, in this uh, weather that you may, some may want to stay outside. So um, I'm going to, I was kind of, a, I guess, a, a facilitator of this event, not, not an organizer, but working with Ukrainian Jewish Encounter and Asia Torah Thornhill coming to show. Uh, we came together and we organized this event. Why me and what's my interest in it? I myself uh, was born and grew up in Ukraine, in Kyiv. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I left. Um, I had somewhat of an uneasy childhood. Um, Ukraine at that time was under the Soviet Union. And uh, I did suffer a lot from antisemitism, from uh, people uh, looking down at me because of the Jewish. Um, so when I left Ukraine, I thought it was for good. It was, I was happy to leave. I thought I would never come back. Um, well, about two years ago, uh, I decided to visit my mother's grave, who is buried in Kiev. And, um, and to my shock, to my mm-hmm. amazement, the country completely changed. It had done a 180 turn to become a multicultural, European cosmopolitan capital, not unlike any other city in Europe. It's gorgeous, the bridges, the architecture, and most like most, what amazed me most is the people, the new Ukraine, the new generation of Ukrainians who have come, uh, who, who, who were born there and who grew up there. Um, I was just amazed at, at, at the acceptance and, and complete um, acceptance of, I guess, of people who are. Um, you know, not Ukrainians, like myself, as a Jew. Um, so, and it reminded me of another country, Israel. And Israel and Ukraine actually had become very close allies. They are close in the sense of they're both uh, new independent countries. They're both trying to grow to uh, become vibrant democracies. And I think there is a huge, um, huge room for co- cooperation and collaboration. So I was very excited when about a year ago, I met, um, I was at Limuda Fasyukian at the conference. For the first time ever, I went to hear one of the UG presentations, and I heard that there is an organization out there who's actually working to create bridges between the Ukrainian and Jewish communities here in Canada and around the world. Um, so, as we all know, there are stereotypes on both sides. We, as Jews, um, obviously cannot forget and remember uh, the pogroms, the Kalnitsky, <coughs> the Odessa pogroms, but also there's a lot of good history. There's a lot of um, neighborly relations that the Jews and Ukrainians had over the generations. Um, and that's what this organization is trying to, to remind everyone and to build those bridges, to build those relationships between those two different communities. And sorry, I, I went for too long, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce mm-hmm. Natalia, who is part of the UG, and he'll, she'll introduce the, the speaker today. Uh, good evening. Uh, actually, I wish Alice, Alex would have continued because it would have made my job a little bit easier because actually Alex is uh, speaking exactly about what our organization is trying to achieve. My name is Natalia Fedrischek. I am Director of Communications for Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. We were established over a decade ago in 2008 with the goal of building bridges and a dialogue between Ukrainians and Jews. And in this period of time, we've done quite a bit. Um, We are a privately funded Canadian nonprofit, and we are very fortunate to um, work with a very wide variety of individuals and, uh, um, and have a very generous benefactor who very much believes in this dialogue between Ukrainians and Jews. And I actually had the um, honor of meeting Yarzbalan a number of years ago um, when I found out uh, that he was working on the story of Rhea Kleiman, a Canadian Jewish reporter who, on her own, essentially had gone off to the Soviet Union. And I, as a journalist by profession, was quite taken with the story because this is a woman who had you know, a lot of chutzpah to sort of get up in in a time um, that was not so good for people to go and and to cover um, the Soviet Union at that time. And as Yoraz began to speak about her story and about his own story, it was just fascinating. 
Yours will tell you the story of Ria. Um, he, in a way, you know, for the Ukrainian community, this is an individual who does not need an introduction. You all have our the little brochure here, so I will let you read his really wonderful story along with being the director of Ukrainian studies at the University of Alberta. He is also a poet um, and a, whose works have appeared in the anthology of Ukrainian poetry of the 20th century. Um, I invite you to, for those who have not picked up a catalog, to please uh, look more at the work that we do. We have a, a book that came out, A Journey Through the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter from uh, Antiquity to 1914. At this point, uh, on the basis of this book, there's an exhibit in view of Ukraine that looks at the Ukrainian Jewish uh, journey from antiquity to 1939. Um, I am taping our discussion this evening for those of you who want to look back on this evening and want to share this evening with your friends. It will be available on our website shortly, ukrainianjewishencounter.org. And I will let, I will now have yours speak about uh, Rhea Kleinman, her journey and his own journey into learning more about the, the history of this really <clears throat> fantastically interesting woman. So yours. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you, Alex, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm just going to warn you that uh, I could talk for Rhea for hours. I won't. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you a part of her story. It's an incredible story that really deserves a lot more attention and uh, deserves to be told in its entirety. But I hope to give you enough of a feel for who she was and what she accomplished, uh, focusing particularly on her time in the Soviet Union uh, up to uh, and uh, into the er, you know in the early 1930s. I'll say a few things about her later years, uh, which I'm still researching, but are no less fascinating than those the years that, that I'll be talking about. I'm going to just begin with two quotes that I, were very important for me. One is from an article that she wrote, published in the Evening Telegram on the 3rd of October, after she visited a city called Kem on the White Sea that was closed to foreigners, and she was there illegally. And uh, while she was there, she met a woman who a cleaning lady who, uh, when Rhea managed to sneak into the city and get a room in a <coughs> rather run-down hotel, but she was thrilled and she kind of burst out laughing and the woman was just stunned and said to her, you know, I've never, I've been, I've been, all these years I've been here, I've never heard anybody laugh. Mm -hmm. And she said, tell the world outside so others may know how, just how horrible the place was. Mm -hmm. Another quote that's kind of uh, important for Rhea's story is a quote by a censor for the Soviets who uh, sneered at her truth, does it matter, is it constructive, that kind of cynical uh, view, which unfortunately seems to be popular more and more these days. The last quote is uh, from a, a visit that she made to a village in eastern Ukraine, where uh, the peasants turned to her and, and told her flat out, tell the Kremlin we are starving, we have no bread. On the 20th of September, uh, Rhea Kleinman was arrested in 1932. She was arrested in Tbilisi, Georgia. This is after she had just spent a couple of weeks driving in a car with two women from Moscow all the way to Georgia. Now, this is 1932 when roads were rudimentary at best, in some places more or less non-existent, wagon ruts, uh, crossing fording streams. That these three women pulled this trip off is astounding. This is uh, her account of her, uh, her, uh, her arrest by the OGPU in Tbilisi uh, in September. At 10, he left. I had to go to the consulate to find out if anything had come from Moscow yet. The moment I came downstairs, I could see that something was up. Our car, which had been standing near the doors since 7, had taken, a, had taken her, I'm sorry, had disappeared. No one knew who had taken her, nor on whose orders. The managers, soldiers, and porters all bustled around me like frightened hens. Would I go upstairs and wait? Someone tried to take my arm. I shook him off. Take your hands off me, I shouted. And the man sprang back as if I'd bitten him. And then, before anyone had time to stop me, I pushed out the door. I pushed the door open and walked out. Why am I doing that? Should have gone. 
Sorry about that. I need to go down down the page on this side here. I wonder if I, how, how I go down here. Maybe I can just move this. No. I just have to do this here. I can go here. Okay, that's what I have to do. Sorry. Take your hands off me, I shouted. The man sprang back as if I'd bitten him. And then before anyone had time to stop me, I pushed the door open and walked out. I felt a sudden shock of surprise to see that the sun was still shining and that people were hurrying to and fro as if nothing were happening. They could not hear my heart hammering. They did not know that I was trembling from head to foot. I walked faster and faster. I would not run. I knew that I was being pursued. If only I could get to the consulate's steps before I was overtaken. I urged myself on and on. It was too late. A little unshaven man in a blue workman's blouse, the one I had seen lounging outside my door, was at my heels now. Go back, he shouted. Go back, I continued to walk on. Go back. I felt something sharp jabbed into the ribs and I stopped. You are under arrest, he said. You must come with me. I refused to budge and asked him to show me the warrant for my arrest. <clears throat> I'm a member of the secret department of the OGPU. I can arrest whomever I so please without a warrant. You come with me to the regional OGPU. I started to go away. He blocked my way. You treat me as a child, he said, ramming the point of the revolver harder into me. I'm a member of a power as great as yours. So here's a woman, that tells you something about her, uh, the, the courage that she had. That here's a guy who uh, came to arrest her. She tried to brush him off. She was racing to the consulate to get a, a, a cable sent to the uh, British Embassy in Moscow informing them that she was in trouble and uh, that they were planning to deport her within 24 hours from Tbilisi and she had been living in Moscow for four years <coughs> and all her belongings were there. This is a dec the, the decree of expulsion that uh, uh, was issued on the 17th of September. This is by the Politburo of the Central Committee of the all Union Communist Party. This is as high as it gets in the Soviet Union. So here's a Canadian woman journalist, a freelance writer really, who gets expelled from the Soviet Union on, an, on the orders of Stalin and a very small circle of <coughs> friends. That's how high a priority was given to her arrest and expulsion. Basically, what Soviet authorities wanted to do was to send a message to other journalists. You don't play by our rules, this is what will happen to you. This is a, a, a page from the uh, a newspaper, uh, Izvestia, which is the official newspaper of the uh, Communist Party. Uh, attacking her as a bourgeois uh, a liar and a bourgeois provocateur. Uh, and this is all done to discredit. This was then translated into English and published in pro-Soviet uh, publications uh, in the Moscow Daily News and, and others in the West, all to discredit her because of the things that she had written that were critical of the Soviet Union. Closer to home, this is the front page of the Toronto <coughs> Evening Telegram on the 20th of September, 1932. You can see a picture of Rhea there in the middle. She gets the banner headline. Her arrest was covered on the same day, reported on the same day in the Border City Star in Windsor, the Winnipeg Tribune, the Brandon Daily Sun, the Medicine Hat News, the Edmonton Bulletin, the Vancouver Sun. It appeared the following day in Toronto's Globe and the Winnipeg Free Press, as well as a second story in the Border City Star. The Montreal Gazette ran the story on 22 September, the Toronto Star on the 23rd of September, and the Windows border, border City Stars again on the 8th of October. Rather than just reporting the news from the Soviet Union, she'd become the news from the Soviet Union. Not something that most journalists uh, care to do, but she didn't have a choice. The, uh, and uh, Ottawa, so that just gives you the Canadian coverage. This is the Edmonton Journal's report on Aria's arrest and deportation. News of her arrest and deportation expulsions are reported in scores of newspapers around the world, throughout Europe, North America, the South Pacific, and the Far East. This is a big international story. Short, it's a short item, a couple paragraphs. <coughs> Still, it was got widespread coverage. It was the first uh, expulsion of a Western journalist in 11 years. These are just some examples of some of the reports as they appeared. This tells you something. Between the 20th and the 25th of September, more than 100 U.S. newspapers carried reports of her deportation. And these included the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Sunday Avalanche, um, Oakland Tribune, 
Oklahoma, you know, all, all kinds of big newspapers, small newspapers, from one end of the country to the other. Of course, she was also reported, her, her arrest was also reported in the Polish newspaper, Gazeta Lwowska, and in newspapers in Spain, in Hungary, in England, uh, and uh, when he was a border city star. As you're looking at these pictures of Rhea, I should tell you that one of the frustrating things is I've not been able to find a decent picture of her. All I've found is the pictures of her that are reproduced in the newspapers themselves. They're not the best quality. I'm hoping, hoping, hoping the family doesn't have any, uh, that somewhere I'll get some decent shots of her. But you can see, here's a good example. This is my, one of my favorite pictures. A very attractive young woman. She was born Richard Gertrude Kleinman in, on the 4th of July in 1904. Uh, she was born in a, a village called Poyanz, uh, Poyan, Poyanich in uh, the Malopolska region of Ukraine, of Poland, modern day Poland. And she came to Canada with her parents and two uh, other siblings, uh, David and Yankel, or Jack, uh, in 1906. Uh, three more uh, children were born in Canada Rose, Murray, and Sarah. This is a map of Poland, and this gives you an idea where. Uh, Poyanitz is in, in, uh, is in uh, uh, Poland today. In Yiddish, I think it's called Planch. Rhea grew up in Toronto. Her parents settled, uh, you know, uh, one block north of Dundas, one block <coughs> west of Young Street, uh, on well, Bay Street, what is Bay Street now, was called Tarawli Street in those days. Uh, Tura Turali Street. The site was developed in 1928 as the 12-story, 750-room Ford Hotel. Some of you remember it. Probably not from its better days. It was kind of a drug and prostitute place uh, when I was growing up already. It was eventually bulldozed. But uh, in those days, this is what it looked like. You can see a couple factories in the background, housing, this gives you an idea of the kind of housing and the factories again in the background. We're talking an immigrant ghetto, a slum. Her parents are poor. There's a back alley. Houses right up, butting up right against the factories. But this is the neighborhood that she grew up in, in Toronto. Here you have a Jewish restaurant, you have a chicken warehouse next door. Uh, a lot of Jewish immigrants settled in this area as well. Agnes Street was the original name of uh, uh, Dundas Street in those days. And again, you look at the housing here, and you can see that uh, probably no, very little insulation in the walls, outdoor toilets, basically uh, pretty primitive conditions. Tragically, at the age of six, Rhea lost her lower left, left leg in an accident when she fell beneath a Toronto streetcar while watching a Victoria Day parade on 24 May 1910. The seriousness of her injury required lengthy and repeated hospital stays over the course of seven years, an experience that seems to have instilled her with a stoic resolve and contributed to becoming a journalist. Um, now, she was taken to Sick Children's Hospital, and uh, while she was a patient there, she came under the influence of the late John Roberts Robertson, the editor and founder of the Evening Telegram, and godfather of the hospital. He was a philanthropist. He used, quote, he used to take a great interest in the patients, she explained. He came to me one day and said, young lady, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I said I was going to be a journalist. I stuck to it, that's all. This is Robertson here. He encouraged her in her ambitions to become a writer, and he gave her a copy of the King James edition of the Bible and said, just read this, you'll learn everything you need to know about how to write. Because, of course, it was a, considered a masterpiece of literature. Though I don't know how uh, much journalistic reporting is done in King James English, but anyways, it obviously gave her and helped inspire her in her future career. Rhea's past path to a journalist career was not an easy one, as besides the poverty of her family, the fact that she was a female with an immigrant background and her physical disability, she also faced serious serious challenges obtaining an education. Her situation was further complicated when her father, Solomon, passed away when Rhea was still a young girl, leaving her mother, Anna, 
Anna, her maiden name was Goldblum, uh, leaving her mother, Anna, with the daunting task of raising two boys and two girls without the help of a family breadwinner. Consequently, Rhea took a factory job when she was only 11 years old and was forced to round out her limited public school education uh, by you know, taking night classes and, and doing self-study. She later supplemented these with night school courses in business and stenography, practical things that could help her get a job. She even managed to attend university during spells between jobs when she was a bit older, though it seems likely, uh, though it seems likely she took some university level classes without ever actually completing a degree. I checked with the University of Toronto, there's no record of her enrollment there, so she might have been just auditing it, uh, that or all, she just never finished, but uh, she did, she, you know, she was bright enough certainly to go to university. In 1921, the census form, which you'll see next, uh, listed her as working as a stenographer. Uh, you won't be able to read it on this, but at the bottom of the page, uh, with Hannah and giving her age and the year of immigration and the, uh, her brothers and sisters at that time. <coughs> this is what downtown Toronto, Queen and Bay looked like in 1923. And this is how Young Street looked in 1924. I'm showing you this because it's just before Rhea departed Toronto to conquer the world. First place she moved was to New York. And uh, she got a job there working for a psychoanalyst, most likely as a receptionist or secretary. It is probably in New York that Rhea came in contact with young people like herself who had socially progressive and politically radical views that led them led them to become members of the pro-Bolshevik American Communist Party. She may have joined the Communist Party then, if not, she probably joined it a little bit later when she moved to London. Because there's a surveillance document, uh, a British uh, intelligence uh, surveillance document that suggests that uh, she was working as a courier for the Communist Party. That would make sense because Rhea's real goal, ultimately, was to go to the Soviet Union where, like many people, she thought she was gonna see the future, a bright future where all kinds of poverty had been eliminated, women had equal rights, uh, workers were in charge of the country and not uh, uh, rich people, all these wonderful things. Her first step, though, was to get herself to London. And in 1927, in June, she sailed for uh, London, uh, where she had a job waiting for her, working as the publicist for the agent general of the province of Alberta, working in Canada House. Her job was to help promote tourism and investment to the province. Uh, not a bad job, and not a great, not a bad posting to go to London, big capital city, you know. Uh, before she went, though, she had to uh, get her papers in order, and one of the things she needed was a birth certificate, and we just found this recently. Uh, on 1 April 1927, she applied for a Canadian birth certificate. And you won't be able to read it because the print is very small, but there are lots of interesting things on this. First of all, her name, Kleiman, which the family spelled K-L-E-I-M-A-N when they got there, and then she began, they began spelling at some point as C-L-Y-M-A-N, though Murray, the oldest brother, continued to spell it with a K. Um, she had written it C-L-Y, and they changed it to K-L-E-Y. -K uh, they give her birth uh, place as Toronto. Not quite. Uh, they say that she was delivered by a midwife. Uh, that would make sense because if she was delivered in the hospital, she probably her birth would probably be registered. The fact that she was delivered by, you know, they figured they'd get away with it, and they did. So she was able to get a Canadian birth certificate that helped her uh, get a passport that she needed to be able to travel to Europe. The document is also interesting because, first of all, her mother, Anna, signed it with an X, meaning she was illiterate. And her father, who it doesn't mention is deceased, was deceased, uh, was, his occupation was given as a junk dealer. So this is a kind of classic immigrant family struggling to survive in the new world. These are her roots. It would, uh, eventually she applied to go to the Soviet Union while she was still in Moscow, in uh, London, sorry. Uh, but nothing, her papers didn't come through. And instead what she did was she went to Paris got a student visa to study French for three months uh, at the Sorbonne, supposedly. Again, I haven't been able to check if that's true, but she went there and she did some teaching of English to help pay for her way. And uh, she uh, eventually uh, 
finished that, and when her visa ran out, rather than going back to London, she moved on to Germany. Germany was a hotbed. The Nazis, the communists, the left, the right, there were huge clashes. It was, a very, it was in, in, in ferment. She thought as a journalist it would be a great opportunity to witness firsthand important historic events. She picked up some German when she was there, and while she was there, she got word that her <coughs> visa had been approved by the Soviet government. Uh, again, probably it helped if she was a member of the, of the party. Uh, uh, regardless, on the 23rd of December 1928, when she was 24 years old, she left Berlin for Moscow by train with little more than 15 pounds sterling in her pocket and the determination to become a foreign correspondent. 15 pounds sterling, that's like 75 bucks US at the time. Oops, I didn't want to do that. And uh, not a lot of money, but a bit, but still pretty amazing. What was even more amazing is she arrives at the main <coughs> train station in Moscow, not speaking any Russian, not knowing a single soul, not having a place to stay. She wanders around the train station. Some guy looks at her and sees that she obviously needs help. Came up to her. Uh, he knew three words of English. Uh, figured out that she needed help. Guided her across the street to a hotel. And at the hotel, it just happened that Negley Farson, a well-known uh, Chicago Tribune journalist, was staying there with his wife. And they took her in, and she spent the first night sleeping in their bathtub. Um, <laughs> A few days later, she managed to get a room uh, at the Quaker House in Moscow, and so was landed in Moscow. I only recently discovered that uh, I thought that she fairly quickly then moved on and, and got a job uh, in her desired profession, or along the lines of her desired profession, but uh, I just came across a letter written in 1931 that said she hated her first six months in Moscow, probably until she learned the language and uh, got herself oriented and got a job. Now, uh, the picture you see is of a famous and infamous New York Times correspondent, Walter Duranty. He won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the Soviet Union, even though, uh, as Malcolm Muggeridge described him, he was the biggest liar he had ever known. One of the biggest lies that he told was when the reports about the famine were starting to come out, famine in, in eastern Ukraine and the, and the Caucasus region, he downplayed them, denied them, dismissed them. Uh, and. Uh, really contributed greatly to the cover-up of the story of the famine. Anyways, he uh, hired her as his secretary and his assistant, and I guess she was very good at it because she did pick up the language and she was motivated. Um, didn't pay her a lot. There's a question about what their relationship was, was really like. Um, he was a notorious womanizer. Uh, he, especially a lot of young women, came and kind of offered themselves to him because he was a celebrity, probably the most famous journalist in the world at the time. Whether uh, Rhea had to cut any deals with him like that is unknown. It could be that she was pretty tough. She, you'll see uh, all through her life she stood up for what she believed in and she wasn't pushed around by anybody. So who knows? It's an open question. Certainly she bore no ill will to him because uh, in later mention of him she showed no signs of uh, hostility towards him. While she was there, uh, she also began establishing connections. And it's amazing those people that she met and got to know. And this is crucial for a reporter. If you're going to report on politics, you've got to know who the players are. You've got to know what's going on behind the scenes, behind the corridors of power. There's a picture of Michael Kalinin, who served as the uh, head of state uh, of the Soviet Union for many years. Um, after some function at the Kremlin, he drove her home in this sh chauffeur driven car. She also met famous feminists. On the left is Nadezhda, on the, the older woman is Nadezhda uh, Krupskaya, Lenin's widow. On the right is very famous writer, author, activist, uh, and diplomat, uh, Alexandra Kolontai. She got to know both of them, or interviewed both of them. She uh, also sh showed great sympathy for Stalin's uh, wife, Nadezhda Alulivna, and uh, when she uh, died and committed suicide, she wrote a very interesting piece where she basically made the case that this was a suicide because she was so appalled by the uh, ruthlessness of her husband's rule. We arrived in Moscow at a perfect time, or a great time actually, because mm -hmm. this was the beginning of the first five-year plan. 
which was answer, you know, advertised with uh, Great Ballyhoo. And I said, after nine months working for uh, Walter Durante, she was able to push off on her own and establish herself freelancing. She began selling her own stories to uh, the London Daily Express in particular, paper that at that time had the largest circulation of any newspaper in the world. So that was a real coup. But of course, she was just a freelancer, so she didn't get a byline. And most of her pieces appeared just as special Moscow correspondent. Uh, so not directly attributed to her. The paper, interestingly enough, was owned by the Canadian uh, Lord Beaverbrook, Max Aitken, who was born not far just north of here, Maple. Anyway, as she started writing her pieces, she and she actually got better oriented in what was going on in Soviet society. Uh, she began seeing the rhetoric, the reality behind the rhetoric, that this was not the utopia that it was presented to be in propaganda for foreign consumption. It's not known when she began to sour on it, but most likely it was a gradual process. Uh, she did have a Russian quote-unquote sweetheart, and it's the only reference I have to any relationship of a romantic nation with which her in her entire life, uh, who was changing money illegally on the black market and sentenced to three years in the far north. Uh, and um, she, uh, in the spring of 1932, she uh, or in the summer of 1932, she actually made a trip to the far north to look at conditions in these labor camps. She was told that, oh, no, no, you know, we re-educate prisoners, they're paid, they're well-fed, they're comfortably housed. Uh, that was true for a very small percentage of the, the prison population. It wasn't true for vast thousands and tens of hundreds of thousands of political prisoners, exiles, uh, who were basically exploited as slave labor. George Bernard Shaw entered her life. George came to uh, Moscow uh, in July of 1931 for a 10-day visit and um, accompanied with an entourage, Lord and Lady Astor, and the English journalist Alfred Collerton. Shaw, who was an admirer of strong men and dictators like Mussolini, and came to an express an admiration for both Stalin and Hitler, was a major apologist for the Soviet regime, and someone who had no problem condoning eugenics, genocide, or the Bolshevik policy of liquidating unwanted elements in Soviet society. His, uh, his admiration for Stalin was undeterred by news of the Soviet show trials, the famine, or reports of brutal repressions. Uh, this is why to this day uh, many people in the Soviet Union loathe the mention of, of Shaw's name. What's interesting though is that uh, Shaw took a liking to her and she reported in a, an article, or she described in an article, or a, a letter actually, to the editor of a journal called The American Mercury, published in 1945, um, where she had written a piece called How Stalin Outwitted <coughs> Shaw. And in it, she related an account of Stalin's meeting with Shaw, uh, and uh, which he des it, des it describes, and this is Shaw's description of his meeting, of his conversation with Stalin, which he personally related to Rhea. And uh, basically, Stalin made Shaw look ridiculous, which is not surprising, because he was kind of ridiculous. But her comments drew an angry response from a defender of Shaw, who basically wrote and said another piece saying, you know what you're talking about. Rhea replied the fo as follows. The Shaw visit lasted 10 days, and I was with Mr. Shaw most of the time. He liked having me around. Even at 76, which he was then, he had an eye for the ladies. And as you can see, she was an attractive young woman. Also, as I had been in Russia for three years and learned the language, he wanted to hear all I could tell him about actual conditions. Mr. Shaw did not like banquets, but he did like visiting churches. Oops. I did that again. I keep, I keep wanting to go down and I go sideways. He did not like banquets, but he did like visiting churches. Professor Lunacharsky and Konstantin Umansky, these are his handlers. Both of them spoke English. Anatoly Lunacharsky was the Commissar of Culture. Uh, Konstantin Umansky at the time was the head of the Soviet Press Bureau. Senior, senior people. One or the other, 24 hours a day, was with Shaw, was in his hotel waiting for him to come out or uh, to show him around with, with the help of others. 
who were attached to the, so the later, uh, so um, they did their utmost to prevent others from muscling in and sh uh, doing stuff. They arranged a very full day of, of activities for him, and then they gave him a couple of hours between five and seven in the <coughs> afternoon, because he was an older man to go to his room, lie down and rest a little bit. Well, Shaw was full of energy at that, even then. And he arranged with Ria, Ria would come with a friend from the British Embassy, who if Umansky or uh, Lunacharsky was downstairs, they would take him on to the bar. She would sneak up, up, the, up the stairs or up the elevator, grab Mr. Shaw, and they'd go out the back door, and then she had two uninterrupted hours showing him a different Moscow than he was gonna get from the Soviet authorities. It didn't change Shaw any. I said he was interested in, in seeing churches, and this was a time of the anti-godless campaign, it was at its height. Um, but he was curious, he liked to, to uh, visit these churches and everything, and she, she showed him around, but they obviously hit it off. And, um, uh, let me just go again here. And this, so she began increasingly seeing this, but Rhea's, um, She became more and more uh, disillusioned, particularly, I mean, one of the points she made was is that, you know, workers uh, in, on relief in Canada live better than ordinary workers do in the Soviet Union in this worker state. Uh, this is, of course, the time of the Depression. Things were really hard here. Things were hard in Russia, a lot harder in, some, in many respects for most people. Rhea knew this firsthand because while she was in Moscow, she didn't make a lot of money as a freelancer, and so she rented a room in a communal flat with more than a dozen people living in it, nine of them children, a couple of generations of a family. She had a room to herself. They had another room for the 12 of them, and uh, they shared a bathroom and a washroom. So uh, she saw what a struggle it was for them to survive, and they were thrilled that she was living with them. <coughs> of course, she had Western currency. She could buy some things in shops that nobody could get if you didn't have a web, you know, unless you were a foreigner. And so that she, her presence with them really, uh, uh, really improved their, the quality of life. In, uh, when Shaw returned to uh, London, he told his good friends, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, or Lord and Lady Passfield, who are fellow Fabian socialists and good friends of his, and they were planning a trip to the Soviet Union. He says, you gotta meet this woman, you gotta meet this woman. Well, it just ha so happened that uh, Rhea was visiting London in April of 1932, and she, is there something flashing for some reason? Is the battery about to go? Looks like a light is flickering there. Oh, there. okay, that's there, as long as it's not here. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, they, uh, they met with her, and it's fascinating because Beatrice wrote this up in her diary, and the entry is absolutely interesting. Very different from another woman they were talking about, a Moscow, uh, was Rhea Kleinman, a Moscow acquaintance of another friend, Tani's, who came for a night on Friday. A clever little adventuress who came for a night on Friday. Canadian born, Jewish father, Irish mother. Now where the hell this Irish mother comes from, I don't know. Later on, there's a, uh, she refers to her, there's a source that says she referred to her father as being uh, Jewish, but her mother as being Something, uh, the opposite, anyways. Undergraduate of Toron at Toronto, though she did not, uh, as far as I could tell, uh, or she did not graduate. But what's, I think, really telling about the whole account of uh, uh, Beatrice is just how patronizing it is. She preferred, she preferred to start wandering at the age of 21 about the world. She says, without any visible means of subsistence, picking up her livelihood as she went from capital to capital. So, she is physically attractive, would be pretty if her expression were not odiously, distinctly a man's woman, very free and easy and indiscreet. You've got to do a British accent, really, to pull this off, snobby British accent. Neither Sydney nor I liked her, though our suspicions as to her virtues, virtue may be wrong or at least maybe exaggerated, but she is a common little thing with no intellectual background and no moral scruples. In the last, um, in the last word of cynicism, she winks sly suspicions, snarls and sneers at persons and causes, 
anarchist by temperament, she started on her wanderings with a bias towards communism because it stood for atheism and rebellion against accepted codes of communism. Now she loathes Russian communism and all its works and spends her time trying to disabuse us. One perpetual flow of accusation and insinuations against everyone concerned. Her objection to the present state of things are that the people are virtually starving, that no intellectual worker is secure, that men and women are left, are bound to their place of work, that they are compelled to work o overtime at other jobs, nominally voluntarily, but really to save their livelihood, that the housing is a scandal, that the grandiose industrial scheme, Nipostroy, etc., the, the dam on the deeper river, are white elephants, that machines are destroyed, that the collective farms are dead failure, and there is famine in the Ukraine and the, Co and the Crimea. What's the good of all this effort and sacrifice? Nothing will come of it. It is all wasted. No one will be the better for it. Meanwhile, everyone is wretched. Everyone is wretched. Uh, except the party fanatics and officials who delight in bossing the show. I give not her actual words, which I cannot remember, but the impression left on our minds. Mm -hmm. Kind of tells you something about the webs. Needless to say, they dismissed everything that Rhea told them about the Soviet Union. They went the following year, from May to July, uh, and they used their trip as the basis for producing a highly influential and laudatory 1,000-page account titled Soviet Communism, A New Civilization, uh, originally published in 1935 and twice reprinted, the third edition appearing in 1941. This book was hugely influential on the left. Uh, in convincing people on the left that really, yeah, there was some acknowledgement that there were some problems, but uh, that uh, Soviet Union was on the right path and that give it a little bit of time, everything's going to be great. The next person you're seeing here is a man named Sir Reader, Consul General in Leningrad, when uh, Rhea met him and got to know him. And he's very interesting because he visited, she visited twice with him, once when she was with Shaw, and once again the following year when she was <coughs> on her way and coming back on this trip that she made to the far north. He was very impressed with Rhea personally and specific, especially with the quality of the observation she made about her trip to the far, more, far north. Around this time, so we're now talking uh, spring of 1932, Rhea sort of ma makes a really important Canadian connection. She has an article published in Maclean's magazine, I think something we all know. Uh, called Is Russia Going Capitalist? And in, the in this article, she essentially argued that the revolution had run out of steam and that the Bolshevik leadership had become an ossified elite who refused to recognize the failure of so many of their policies. The second article that she wrote was called Russia's New Woman, and it was devoted to describing the situation of women in Soviet society who in some respects had achieved a notable degree of equality with men, meaning they could hold factory jobs, do hard physical labor, and uh, and earned equal wages for the same work. But at the same time, they were often treated badly by men and were expected to conform to the traditional roles that were uh, in what remained an effectively patriarchal society. Although not entirely negative, as she gave credit to some of the legal gains made by women and acknowledges there were signs of some positive changes taking place. For instance, there was a decree that allowed women to dress a little more feminine, you know, express their feminine natures in the way they dressed and the fact they could wear some makeup. Uh, she still thought that there were all kinds of problems. What it does though show is that uh, Rhea had very strong feminist views and one of the interesting things about her reporting is, is that she always made a point of trying to capture and describe what was life for women? Very often people go on, you know, it's a worker state and all of this, and somehow the women are in the background. She wanted to know how they lived, how they survived, because they had to, they had to do work. And she captured some of this in her piece uh, about um, Russia's new women. Quote, the position of women in Russia, a middle-aged woman remarked bitterly, bitterly, this is while she's riding a bus and they're all standing there and this woman gets on with a couple of bags of food and barely stand. 
was first in the queues and last on the bus. She carried two large wicker baskets with potatoes and frozen cabbage. Every time the bus lurched, she was flung off her feet and vegetables rolled in all directions. But no one offered her a seat. I've been up since six, she continued, after I had persuaded her to put one basket in the aisle to leave a hand free, strap, free for a strap, but no one offered her a seat. Rushing about all over town to get these, pointing to baskets, there are no vegetables in the shops now, and I had to go to the Borota market to get them, where everything was about five times the price. I still have got dinner to cook and the washing to do before my husband gets up. It's my free day also. Free day, an equally laden young woman retorted hotly. Free for the men, they sleep or are off to the for Svidanya's rendezvous with her girlfriends. Looking menacingly at the row of seated men, none of whom stood up and offered their seats to these women, uh, one, two of them did manage to blush. They're off to Svidanya's, Svidanya, she repeated loudly, and their wives slave at home. So this is the state of women's equality uh, as we see it. Now, I'm going to jump ahead here. In uh, the beginning of July of 1932, Rhea embarks on a pretty amazing trip. She leaves Moscow by train. Uh, she is supposedly under the sponsorship of the Karelia Timber Trust, uh, and she's going to investigate conditions in the forests, uh, in the forestry industry of the far north, where there are also labor camps, and there are mines uh, that are using slave labor. Uh, this is important because uh, uh, the Soviets were selling, were desperate to sell goods in the Western, resources in the Western markets. They needed the cash desperately because they were virtually bankrupt. And uh, they began to sell timber in large quantities to the Brits. And that uh, totally undercut the Canadian market in England. So Canadian uh, lumber industry was furious that the Brits were buying this labor. And it's basically saying, look, how can we compete? This is product of slave labor. These people are are paid nothing. They work them like dogs. They work them till they die, till they drop or whatever. How are we supposed to compete against this? Well, she went to find out the truth and she saw the truth. Uh, and what she saw was basically that, yeah, hundreds of thousands of people so I'm building the White Canal, working in mines in the far north, um, that uh, under horrific conditions, that this was true. And she wrote about this in a couple of articles that she managed to sneak out of the country past the censors, and they got published in uh, that uh, September, October in the London Daily Express. And when the Soviets saw, first of all, these articles in the Canadian, uh, in uh, Maclean's magazine, and these articles about the far north, they were furious. And that is what got her expelled, is on the basis of those pieces that she was kicked out of the Soviet Union. But. Here's uh, just a, some sampling uh, of, of some of the articles. I won't read uh, any of this. Uh, I said the most interesting <coughs> one is that she made it to this closed town of Kem uh, on the White Sea. And it was a staging area and the administrative center for the Solovetsk Island Prison, where there were about 10,000 political prisoners in horrible conditions, uh, cultural figures. It's like the whole half of the Ukrainian cultural elite was there. Had been de uh, had deported, arrested, and deported under the Soviets, and many of them were eventually shot or died there. And uh, her goal was to try to get to it. And again, this is a woman with chutzpah. So first of all, she gets to the train station. She gets off the train. The train leaves, and it's not the next train doesn't come for three days. So she's there for three days. She, I said, has no place to stay, but she spoke Russian fluently. She probably could pass as a Russian. She had learned already by then that really who ran the show was the secret police. They ran the, the country. So what does she do? She goes to the secret police guy in the station, says, demands him to get him, help her get to the town. The town was uh, four miles away. Every time a bus came, it would pack with people. She could never get on the bus uh, in time and get a place. So he eventually commandeers a wagon and they pile her on. They take her to this place and she uh, gets a room in this, in this hotel. This is the story that I began, this is the quote here. It says, you were laughing, she replied. This is the cleaning lady. I've been in this town three years and I've never heard anyone laugh. We, re we Russians have forgotten how. This is the town of the Zhivoy Troop, of living corpses. Write this, you're a journalist. Tell the world outside so others may know. And with this, she walked out. 
This is because Rhea had burst into laughter when the uh, uh, manager of the hotel had left the room and the cleaning lady came in. And this was nervous laughter. She says, man, I pulled it off. I gate crashed him. She was like, all right. And then when this woman responded this way, she writes, I was awed into silence. Quickly the gloom and fear that hung over Kemp settled on me. Even the gay sunshine streaming in the room could not fit in. And these are some of the articles about her chem visit. Now, uh, while she was there, she made a visit also further north to, the, uh, to a uh, mining community called Hibinogorsk. And there, I mean, workers, uh, mine workers were living in tents in the middle of winter. During the winter, they lived in these tents. The sanitary conditions were horrible. The number of people who died of dysentery, typhus, the children who, who didn't survive, it was horrible. Uh, she talked, she, she uh, talked to someone, she says, have you been, how, have you been in Hibinogorsk long? I asked them, she's talking to one uh, resident there, a tall blonde youth. No, I came from the Ukraine two months ago. Voluntarily? Yes, we have nothing to eat there. My people were sent here two years ago and they wrote me that there was work and plenty to eat, so I came. That, I thought, explains the migration of peasants. It is, for, it is a trek for food, because there are some people who were arrested and exiled, and there are some people who are just driven out by the collectivization process. I'm going to start winding down, and this will be time so for some questions. But Rhea then embarks, she gets back to Moscow, and literally three weeks later, she embarks on an even more incredible trip. Described as a 5,000 mile, it wasn't, it was about 1,700 miles, but that still is no mean feat in a, a vehicle with these two women, uh, society girls from Atlanta who had come to see the great future uh, that the Soviet Union was supposed to represent. Here's a map of their trip through uh, what in the uh, telegram account of it was built under the heading The Famine Lands of Russia. Uh, so you can see starting in Moscow, going through uh, Russia into eastern Ukraine to Kharkiv, going through some of the places where the current fighting is taking place, Horyivka, Slovyansk, Donetsk, Luhansk, uh, and then through the Caucasus, the, uh, what the Ukrainians call the Kuban region, where many Ukrainian Cossacks had settled earlier, and were still very Ukrainian, and were also suffering uh, from famine, and eventually making their way all the way to Belize, Georgia. This is the car that they traveled in. These are the two women, Alva Christensen and Mary El Dejiv, uh, who were 22 years old. So Rhea was already an experienced Soviet hand, right? And she knew her way around, she spoke the language. They, uh, uh, they planned their trip. This is what, uh, 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 and what's inter interesting is that Alva ended up writing a series of eight articles that were published in the Chicago Tribune describing the same trip. Rhea wrote 21 articles, they appeared a little bit later. So you get two accounts of the same trip by two different people. Here is how Alva described getting Rhea to serve as their guide. We planned carefully, but before we left, we ran up against many more yards of red tape. Interest, the travel agency, said we would have to take one of their interpreters with us. Amtor had, to had chosen a GPU man for the job. Avtodor, or the automobile club, had chosen another GPU agent. Mary L. and I stood pat. We said we wouldn't take any interpreter of their choice. We wanted to choose one for ourselves. Our wishes were at last granted. We picked Rhea Kleiman, a Canadian woman and a newspaper correspondent who had been in Russia for four years. As it turned out, we made an unwise choice. Mm. Now, you have to understand, Rhea was a, obviously a type A, a, a personality, and I have a feeling <laughs> Alva was a pretty similar personality, and I'm sure that, you know, a car bumping along these roads, sleeping under the car at nights in very many cases, uh, you know, camping out as they were going along, uh, things got pretty tense between them. Later, uh, Alva would describe Rhea's arrest and expulsion as follows. <clears throat> I'm under arrest, she said, for an article written five months ago entitled, Is Russia Going Capitalist? I've been ordered to leave the country in 24 hours, but have refused. For two days, Ms. Kleiman remained in Tiflis, or Tbilisi, dashing back and forth to one of the consulates there asking their advice. She had wired to the British Embassy at Moscow for its assistance. The reply came telling her to ask for permission to be sent to Moscow. 
As she was not allowed to leave the hotel the last day she was with us, we carried her messages to the console. It seemed very stupid that it had taken the GPU five months to find her article and to decide to expel her from the country. But we did not blame them, as she was quite unpleasant. <laughs> she was finally sent back to Moscow and then expelled in 24 hours. Well, um, I can just say, I know, is there anybody here from, is uh, Danny or anybody here from the Schiff family? Uh, family members of uh, Rhea, so her brother's nephew's widow uh, uh, lives in, 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 uh, in Toronto. And uh, she remembers uh, Rhea coming to Toronto on a couple of occasions. She would stay with her sister Rose, but she said, you know, after a day, Rose would be calling saying, take her, take her, I can't stand this woman, I couldn't. <laughs> and the family, didn't <coughs> the family didn't know what to make of her. Because you tell these stories about her life and, you know, George Bernard Shaw, Mikhail Kalinin, Grupskaya, you know, all these people, these this incredible experiences that she had, and they didn't really kind of believe her. They just thought it was, you know, maybe she was making some of it up or whatever. Anyways, these are these two women that uh, they uh, traveled with. Here's a picture of them with their car. This is some shots from the route. I'm trying to find if there are other photographs besides the ones that were published in the uh, Chicago Tribune uh, in January. And, and basically, she scooped uh, Rhea to some extent by publishing her account of that trip before Rhea got hers into print. Rhea's articles about the uh, visit to the far north, a couple of them, and a couple about the trip through the famine lands did appear in the Daily Express in uh, November of 1933. And it began with an open letter that was she addressed to uh, Yagoda, Gendrik Yagoda, who was the head of the uh, secret police. And this gives you a flavor of it. You accused me of sending out alarming reports about the food situation in the towns and the famine in the villages. Can you deny that mothers and families have now been deprived of their bread cards? That children under eight years of age have not received <coughs> milk for 10 months? That workers in the mining areas of the Donetsk Basin and in the Urals have only potatoes and black bread to live on, and that the last time they received meat was for the November 7th celebration. The OGPAU, the OGPOU cooperative is the finest in Moscow. Your workers get meat and butter every month, but the children in the villages of the Ukraine near Izum and Nikitova were eating grass when I saw them a few months ago. The workers in Rostov eat bread made of corn chaff and straw. The Soviet government needs gold to meet its foreign commitments. So you arrest elderly women and keep them for months without notifying their families to get the last diamond ring or gold bracelet. But the OGPU continues to import expensive new motor cars. She wasn't pulling any punches. She was out, once she was out of the country, she just let loose. Anyways, her time in the Soviet Union is coming to an end. and. Uh, I'll just continue on a little bit more with her further story, which is no less interesting. These are some of the articles that uh, she wrote from that trip. Um, and um, the most interesting one is when she was, uh, first of all, she's in Kharkiv. What's interesting is that when she was traveling from, she spent the first night in Yasnaya Polyana, Tolstoy estate. She stayed in the house with the two, with her two traveling companions, they allowed her to use some of the rooms. She was in um, uh, Orel, Kursk, and Belgorod in Russia. No problem finding food. Conditions weren't great, but she was able to buy from peasants. She was able to find in markets and in shops in, in those cities they could obtain food. When she crossed the border into Ukraine, things were different, particularly in Kharkiv, the capital of Ukraine. We had been two days in Kharkiv, but we were all anxious to get away. The great Ukrainian capital was in the grip of hunger. Beggars swarmed around the streets. The stores were empty. The workers' bread rations had just been cut from two pounds a day per person to one pound, per, to one pound uh, and a quarter. A young Ukrainian girl, Alice Mertska, had come begging to our hotel for food. She had lived in New Toronto for nine years. Her father worked for the Massey Harris Company. Three years ago, she and her father came back to Russia to get work at the tractor plant in Kharkov. Now, we're, now we are without bread, she told me. 
she, uh, the women leave the city early in the morning before the restaurant is open in their hotel. They go to this huge tractor factory, Tractor Savod, which she then describes as being a dump. It isn't open yet. She goes there because she knows that there are foreign workers there, and wherever there are foreign workers there, there are special cafeterias that serve them food when the other workers get nothing or next to nothing. And, uh, but nothing was open. They weren't able to get any food, so they headed out of town hungry. The next thing they did was they start driving south, and they drive past mile after mile of deserted villages in Ukraine. And uh, this is when the sort of light went on in her head. So, oh, this is where I saw those peasants in the far north, and this is where you see these peasants swarming the cities of, all across the Soviet Union, fleeing from the, from the famine. She uh, pulls into a village uh, where there seems to be some activity. Some women are having a little bit of a market. They're basically selling stuff from their gardens. This is September. Uh, harvest time is a, a good time to get food. Uh, and um, so things are better. She wants to buy some milk and some eggs. She starts going to <coughs> talk to the women. First thing that she finds out is she approaches them, each of them, and she's speaking Russian, and they don't understand Russian, they only speak Ukrainian. The languages aren't that, that different, but this is a village that rarely had any contact with Russian speakers. Not only that, uh, they said, they told her, but that little boy uh, interpreted for them and said, well, uh, we don't have any milk or eggs. The collective farm has taken all of that. They took all the livestock, they took all the animals. Uh, all they had to live on was their gardens. And then finally one of them says, you know, I live in a neighboring village. I might be able to scare something up. She gets in the car with them. They drive a couple kilometers to the neighboring village. She waits until the whole village comes out. It's the first time a car has been in the village. And uh, the headmaster, the head of the village comes out and he starts and he asks, he says, so, uh, you've come from Moscow? Yes. To investigate conditions here? Yes. He said, will you tell the people, you tell the Kremlin the people are starving. And then the women started undressing the children. It always, it always gets me. And the children, of course, have these distended bellies and rickety legs. They had barely survived the spring. Summer was better, but he, they all knew that basically a death sentence was waiting for them because as soon as their food ran out from their garden, whatever they could keep, whatever the... And then, what, of course, then what happened is they sent in special squads and even took food from uh, food sellers and things like that, um, that they wouldn't survive. So, uh, but it so moved. Uh, Rhea, that she had to look away, and she, and she made a promise, she said, I will tell the world about this. And she did. <coughs> so, she also saw things, you know, she, she was at a, a sanatorium in, uh, I think it was in Horyuka, and they uh, was put in a room with a bunch of women, and the two women who were traveling with her. Most of the women were there because they were suffering the effects of malnutrition. But there was one rather portly woman, a communist official. She was there because it was advised that she needed to have a little bit of relaxing time and take a cure, you know, like they like to do there. And of course, the women were peppering her with questions about Canada. Is it true that workers eat meat there? Is it true that there's white bread there? Is it true, you know, asking only, and, and Rhea was answering honestly, and this woman was intervening. Nobody is interested in that, you know, uh, slapping them down, and they eventually <laughs> shut up and whatever. But it sort of she captures these wonderful moments all along her trip uh, in the Kuban area, in the Caucasus, in the middle of they they camp out one night by a field, and all of a sudden there's some activity. Next thing you know, there are these uh, local peasants, a squad that's kind of coming, they're going to burn the field. Uh, and they, they, you know, are gonna. The women were terrified. That, what are, you know, they're gonna see us because you can get shot for, for a sabotage like this, and that she could be, they could be implicated. And uh, but their answer was, is they just shot 15 of the people in our village, and we're gonna show them. We're gonna show them. Uh, and uh, she also describes seeing like watchtowers at the corners of the fields, and all night long there was somebody with a, with a gun. So if a peasant dared to crawl out. On their stomach between the sheaves and between the stalks of wheat to, to shake some uh, kernels off and, and to take to, for themselves, they'd be shot. So she really captures uh, the horror of the, of, of the period in her, uh, in her articles. Now, what's really interesting is after she got out of it, said she could write honestly about this, and in one of her pieces in the uh, uh, 
Daily Express uh, under the heading Crime Wave Sweeps Russia, Workers Smashing Red Regime. It's a little bit optimistic, I think, on her part. But she makes this interesting observation. The most interesting development in Soviet Russia is the increase in chauvinism. It's not from the working class or the peasant that Stalin draws his support now. It is from the bourgeoisie and the surviving military families. They see in him another Genghis Khan, and they believe that this attempt at economic conquest is only a prelude to a military one. Now, the people that she's describing, the bourgeoisie and the military class, are the most Russo, uh, they're most Ukrainophobic, anti-Ukrainian, you know, chauvinistic, reactionary elements. And they had been pushed out of government right after the revolution. Stalin brought them back in, and with them came with that mentality that Ukrainians are rachle, ignorant, backward, stupid peasants, you know, that allowed them to uh, uh, treat uh, the Ukrainian population as callously as they did. And these are other pieces. Now, when she got out, she uh, wrote up, she spent time in London writing mm -hmm. up her experiences on this uh, road trip. And she submitted it as a manuscript to GM Dent, Dent Company in, uh, in London. And she got an immediate letter back from one of the editors saying, this is, thank you, you know, we'll give this, definitely give you the attention and everything. What's amazing is the very next day he writes a letter saying, listen, sorry, some other manuscript. We just accepted another a manuscript. I'm pretty sure it's a book by Mary Hamilton, who had been to Soviet Russia and wrote a big book about it. And they weren't going to release two books on the same theme in the same publishing season. Thank you, but no thanks. So she's got this manuscript. She needs to make money. Of course, she's still a freelancer. Uh, when she got back to, um, uh, when she was arrested, uh, the Daily Express is very interesting, was very careful because she was described as the correspondent for the Daily Express and they said, no, 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 she was a contributor, not a correspondent. She wasn't on their payroll. They paid her per piece and made that distinction, partly, I think, to protect themselves that if they ever wanted to send a correspondent that they wouldn't then say, your last correspondent was kicked out, we're not going to accept them from you. This is... Um, um, I said it was her manuscript was rejected uh, in one day. Anyway, she comes back to Toronto, and eventually what she does is she sells the series of articles, 21 articles that were published in the Toronto Evening Telegram, not for a great sum of money. And then what's really interesting is that, unlike some of the other correspondents who went from Canada and went on six-week, two-month junkets around the Soviet Union, and who wrote, you know, who before they left wrote, we're going to tell the truth about it. We're going to tell it the way it really is. And it's going to be balanced. We're not just, it's not going to be negative, you know, they're not going to go looking for dirt or anything like that. And they wrote pieces that were, on the whole, apologetic for much of the Soviet Union. Yes, they acknowledged their problems. Yes, their democracy was the kind of democracy that nobody in our country would tolerate. <coughs> but they were making great plans. And this is the future, centralized planned economy. This is, this is where society is going, and it's going to come, be, come around the world. Um, she, um, she sold it to them, uh, and it, what's also interesting is it was, never, it was never reprinted in other newspapers. I haven't found it reprinted anywhere else that serious, and yet it's very, very powerfully written. Now, um, she hung around. Nobody offered her a job at the, any of the major newspapers, and unlike these other correspondents, one of them, you know, they arranged a public speech for him at Massey Hall. It was packed to the rafters. Another one spoke to the Canadian club. Uh, they promoted them like crazy, you know, they were, their, they, were, they were stars, star reporters on the Soviet Union. She's a woman, she's a freelancer, she didn't get that kind of treatment. She hung around for several months and decided there's nothing for her in Toronto. So what happens in November 1933, she decides to go to the next happening place, Nazi Germany. Hitler has come to power. Uh, the elections are coming where the Nazis consolidated their hold on power. And she figures she's going to go and she'll be able to spin off some stories and sell them uh, as a freelancer about the elections. She arrives in Berlin a few days before the elections. She spends election day traveling around with a group of journalists, including a Canadian named Lucan Johnson, visiting working class districts in Berlin reporting on the voting. Uh, and um, uh, Johnson, is, is, it's an interesting story in itself because he... Uh, <laughs> He was a very traditional guy. He was a good journalist. 
he, uh, I think he was shocked by, by Rhea. They were in the same car. And uh, I think that she, he found her like a manly woman, you know, like that she was like a man. She was tough and thing and, and not feminine the way she was supposed to be. And all he wrote about her in his diary was capital B A D, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, bad. Uh, he couldn't take her feminism. Anyways, uh, she also used her time in Berlin to parlay it into a job. And she uh, started badgering the Berlin uh, bureau chief for the London Daily Telegraph to take her on it because the, the position of Munich correspondence had been vacated. And she decided to, uh, she wanted to get it. This guy here did a very perverse but interesting thing. He said, okay, he's going to see what kind of, what her medal is. Get a, do an interview with Julia Streicher. Julia Streicher was this rabid anti-Semite infamous for publishing a, rab, a notoriously anti-Semitic rag called Der Sturm. He published anti-Semitic children's book. He used to say he could smell a Jew in the room, right? She goes, not only does she get an interview with him, she charms him. <laughs> so, uh, where is her, this is, and again, this is typical, this is typical of, of her. <clears throat> The interview, which began with Stryker striking a rather Mussolini-like pose behind a large desk, and me in a small castered chair facing him, ended with me wedged against the wall and Stryker almost in my lap. I kept pushing away from him with his wine-laden breath and the droplets of saliva oozing from the corner, as corners of his mouth, and he kept bringing his chair forward, chair forward to emphasize some point. He remained entirely good-tempered throughout even after I rather brashly asked him whether he was entirely sure he had no trace of Jewish blood. <laughs> his answer, this is, this is what I mean, chutzpah, you know. <laughs> his answer, which my Berlin colleagues never got tired of having me repeat to them was, mein Vater war Franken, meine Mutter war Schwaben, das gibt Temperament. At the conclusion, he escorted me to the door, assured me that I had made a good impression on him, both as a woman and as a journalist, and that I must not be backward in calling him if I needed any help. Strange to relate, throughout the nearly seven years I remained in Germany, Stryker was a constant standby whenever a ministry or Herr von Ribbentrop's special, uh, whenever uh, the propaganda ministry or Herr von Ribbentrop's special office you know, declined an interview. An interview with Stryker was enough to cancel out all their good impressions. And Stryker, being the actor that he was, Charles Hathaway used to say, never cared about what anyone wrote about him as long as they wrote about him. Um, again, what she does, she lives in Nazi Germany, she, meets, she wants to meet the players. She gets to know Rudolf Hess. And in 1941, uh, when Hess flew out to Scotland on his quixotic mission of peace, he jumped out of the plane, and everyone wondered, is he sincere, you know, is this uh, set up? She writes his piece in the Toronto Telegram, saying, yeah, he's sincere. I said, I know the guy. I met him in 1934 at a rally, and it's clear she must have been standing on stage within two, three feet of Hitler and him, because he said that they, the two of them locked eyes with each other in a kind of trance as Hitler was raving. <laughs> and uh, I said, she was, I, she, what she witnessed in her life is absolutely astounding. She, another story about Rhea from her German years. She, uh, uh, was at some function, they played Deutschland über alles, everybody, you know, does the Heil Hitler salute, not Rhea. The officials notice this, they get really upset, they file a complaint, they're going to kick her out. They're going to shut down the uh, tele Daily Telegraph office. It took the British Foreign Office to intervene to keep them, you know, back off, back off, and she was allowed to stay. Uh, she also describes at one point uh, coming down some stairs where some SS guys are going upstairs and they did the Heil Hitler salute and she responded, Rule Britannia. Uh, <laughs> so this is a woman who had a cheek, you know, and she, uh, she survived her time in, uh, uh, in Nazi Germany. Uh, while she was there, again, her charmed life, she slipped out and was the only Canadian newspaper woman to cover the marriage of Wallace Simpson and Edward, um, and, uh, which was boycotted mostly by the, by the royal family, but also by the Canadian press. They didn't want to write about it, but she was there. And she, uh, in 1938, four days after, five days after Kristallnacht, she is on a plane, supposedly flying to England on a holiday. 
from Berlin to um, Amsterdam, KLM flight on a DC-3. She uh, decided to go on Saturday the 14th because she didn't want to fly on Friday the 13th. Bad luck. <laughs> the plane crashed several miles out of Schiphol Airport. Uh, four crew members and two passengers were killed. She was one of 13 survivors. I'll show you just a couple of pictures to show you what a remarkable, what a miracle it was that anybody uh, walked away from this. Let me just jump ahead here. Rhea Chloe, so here's the, here's the piece in the Globe describing her uh, being in the plane crash. This is the actual plane. This is a photograph of the actual plane. There's an aerial view of the crash site. And then take a look at this plane. How anybody survived this is astounding. Rhea, uh, Rhea was uh, one of the three passengers most seriously injured. She had a fractured spine. Fortunately, she didn't get paralyzed. She spent several months in hospital, in uh, Wilhelmina Hospital in, uh, whatchamacallit, in, the, uh, in Amsterdam uh, before she was well enough and she returned to England. In England, she then got assigned by the uh, Daily Telegraph to be the Canadian correspondent based in Montreal. First time that the paper had assigned a Canadian correspondent. First thing she does, she goes to see the High Commissioner, who happened to be Vincent Massey, a name you'll be familiar with, was our first Governor General, he was the High Commissioner then. He was so impressed with her, and I'll just read you this, I'll just, I'm going to end with this uh, return to Canada and then I'll... If you look here, there's, see there's, there are pictures of her. She's an attractive woman, interesting woman. Oh. Where are my, I'm wondering, no wonder. I don't know. Well here, oh, that was, those are the things. What was I looking for? <laughs> Anyways, he wrote a wonderful letter to Prime Minister William Mackenzie King's private secretary saying, I just met this woman, and he describes her, says she was in the, she just got back from Germany, she looks very, know, very knowledgeable, very intelligent, uh, you know, do anything you can to help her. Uh, he, was, he really was impressed with her, and uh, the <coughs> secretary wrote back saying, absolutely, I'll meet her, uh, just that I'm traveling right now with the King and the Queen, this is the royal visit, mm -hmm. and with the Prime Minister, and I'll be back in Ottawa in mid-July, so once I get back, tell her to come and I'll be happy to help her to introduce, because she had to, again, to meet influential people that she needed as a reporter. She was in Canada from 1939 to 1942. She spent some time in Toronto. She looks like uh, she was let go by the Daily Telegraph probably sometime in 1940. She moved to Toronto. She worked as a secretary at a uh, radio station. She also had a radio program, 15-minute little talks that she gave. And, uh, but again, she saw that there was no future for her here. Nobody was coming to her and saying, wow, what an incredible life. You have reported from one, you from one totalitarian dictatorship, from another totalitarian dictatorship, nothing like that. <coughs> she moves to, moved to the United States. She managed then to get a job with the OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, the forerunner to the CIA, which makes perfect sense. Here's a woman who knew two regimes. She knew the players in Nazi Germany and in uh, Soviet Union. And she uh, uh, did that for till the end of the war. And then she applied for a job, and this is the CIA, the OSI was reorganized, and she applied for a job that required security clearance, it was denied. So the rest of her life she spent going from job to job trying to survive. She had no pension. Uh, she worked for two months for Reuters uh, as a secretary. She worked as a secretary for other businesses and she found it boring and either she quit or they fired her because she didn't give a hoot about her job. She sold uh, stocks for a while, anything it took to survive. But this is a woman who never complained and I've got a couple of letters from her written in the uh, 1950s and 60s. And then the last letter that uh, we have of her is written in 1976 to her nephew here in Toronto, Dick Schiff, where Dick had obviously written to her, he was the developer of Bramoline. And it was just the beginning, and he said to her, look, if you got a few bucks you want to invest, I think it's going to make a lot of money, which it did. Um, 
and she writes a nice letter back saying, thanks, Dick, but, you know, I got a couple stocks, but she had, she had no money. She didn't have two nickels to, to her name. She was living, she was quite poor at the end. And she, she said, you know, I'm having trouble with my eyesight, and I've got heart problems. I'm trying to get an old age home. So she was in failing health. She died um, in uh, 1981 in New York City, uh, four days shy of her 77th birthday, July 1st. Uh, and uh, what's really sad is that what happened to her is unknown. There was not a single obituary, not in the New York Times, nothing. She, uh, what happened to her personal effects, she mentioned in an article in the Toronto Telegram, in 19, uh, an article about her in the Toronto Telegram in 1971, that she had written a memoir and that she had shopped it around but nobody was interested because there wasn't a lot of sex and you know, all the things that people were really interested in publishing. Uh, whatever happened to that memoir, I'd love to find it. Mm -hmm. um, who looked after her, uh, disposing of her effects and her remains? We, we don't know. We've got somebody on the case in New York who's trying to get a death certificate for, it, for her, which isn't easy because there are no direct relatives. The grandchildren of, of uh, her siblings is not good enough. And hopefully we'll find out what she died of and if there's any information about uh, <coughs> what kind of a funeral. I've checked. Uh, all the Jewish cemeteries in the New York area um, yeah, for their burials, uh, but she was she was not an observant Jew. She was a cultural Jew. She was a secular Jew. She always identified herself as Jewish, but uh, she wasn't religious. If anything, she was an atheist, and uh, so she probably didn't have a traditional Jewish burial. And I said she may have ended up in a pauper's grave. We'd love to find where she is buried. The family would put up a monument to her, and I think that we should put up a monument. Anyways, thank you very much for your attention. Questions and three topics. Uh, regarding her interview with Rudolf Hess, um, Hess claimed that he was under the orders of Hitler to uh, parachute into uh, England and negotiate some sort of peace. Did her interview confirm that one? Uh, two, you talked about um, her time before she went to Europe that she was uh, going from city to city. Do you think she became a counter-revolutionary agent here in Canada before she even went to the Soviet Union, which would correspond to how she would, in the 40s, uh, later work with the CIA, with the forerunners of the CIA? No, first of all, you should understand that she never lost her progressive views. She was always a feminist. She always believed in social justice. She always believed that there was hope for a better society. She even had contacts for, you know, at the, towards the end of her life with some of her old Soviet hands. And um, uh, she wanted it to work. She really hoped it would work. She just became very embittered with the Russian form of communism, of Bolshevism. Uh, she didn't, I don't think she abandoned her left of center views in the, in the slightest. Um, as far as um, Hess, she never interviewed, I mean, she, inter she got to know him in Germany. She didn't interview him after she got out. All she wrote was is that, uh, listen, Hess understands, he's a smart man, he understands Germany's gonna lead, lose the war. And he's trying to save Germany. That's what his mission's all about. That's why he wants to conclude a peace. Uh, I don't think she believed that Hitler sent him uh, at all. Uh, but I said, well, what's interesting is that she met him on, you know, she, he, he invited her to sit at his table, he, you know, he, he got, she got to know him. I don't know who else she got to know uh, in Germany. Um, but um, I know where she lived in Germany, in Munich. We've got her address. Uh, uh, I also know she wrote a, a very interesting piece in a book called How I Got That Story. And it's a bunch of articles by former journalists who worked overseas describing big stories that they covered. And her contribution was a piece describing how she claims to have delayed the Anschluss or the annexation of Austria by a couple of years because her sources told her near the frontier and that it was going to march into Austria and take it over and that she went to the and found the camp and uh, you know reported on this and that her reports kind of blew the whistle on it and that they backed off from doing it because they lost the element of surprise and it wasn't until 1938 when the Anschluss actually happened. Uh, my sense is that basically she's pretty everything backs her stories back up you know are, are backed up and uh, I don't know, it doesn't surprise me. I'd love to find the story 
that she published about that, or the stories that she published about the uh, that whole episode. But um, we're still working on that part of her life. Yeah. Regarding her stories being backed up, uh, it appears that the Atlanta women didn't back up her story. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it, it appears what? Well, when you said the Atlanta women, they didn't like her. Yeah. I think you're trying to also explain that they didn't. Were they backing up her stories? Or primary observations were the web. Yeah, no, 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 they, 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 they're, consist, they're consistent. Rhea goes into far more detail and she understands what's really going on. She understands the nuances and stuff. So their account is very superficial, but basically it's a, it's a parallel account. And they also, by the time they left the Soviet Union, they were totally disillusioned. They were debriefed by the secretary, by officials at the American Embassy in Warsaw. And they said we, they were lost all of their attraction. Communism had lost all their attraction for them. That they went believers and they came back uh, non-believers. But she specifically went to the Far East to find the labor camp conditions. <coughs> to the Far North. To the Far North to find the conditions there. Yeah. Did the Atlanta women uh, back up any of those? No, they weren't on that trip. So were any of her uh, trips that she took uh, ever uh, co op perhaps? Um, Corroborated? Corroborated by any other uh, established journalist. Well, yes. I mean, there are, there are other rep uh, reporters who... What's, what's important for her in terms of the Ukrainian famine is that she describes the very early stages of it. The worst part, the worst part of the famine, the famine actually occurred after she was kicked out of the Soviet Union. It was between January of 1933 and July of 1933. And probably the most famous account is by... Uh, a man named Gareth Jones, who was a Welsh journalist who managed to walk in the Ukrainian countryside outside of Kharkiv and describe the horrific conditions that he saw there. And there were other, including uh, Harry Lang, uh, actually a, a Jewish journalist and a left-winger socialist, uh, who traveled by train with his wife from Odessa to Moscow through Ukraine and also described seeing you know starving peasants all over the place. And there are other others. So, no, she... Uh, she was a straight shooter. She didn't uh, make things up. The, the only thing she 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 tweaked her bio, her biography in a couple of places. But the far north stuff was what she was expelled for, right? Right. So was there a corroboration with any other established journalists of those uh, claims? At that at that time, I can't think of anything at that time. But I mean, Solzhenitsyn and all these people have written about uh, the Gulag and and what it was like. I mean, there's there's a wealth of literature, and everything corresponds with what she said. So, You said that at the end, you said she lost, um, she was in an accident, she lost her lower... Her, lo her lower left leg. So she had a disability? Yeah, she, she had a, a prosthetic leg. And again, when you think, and you know, those of us who've traveled in Soviet times and whatever, you know, through Eastern Europe know what it's like schlepping around, like I mean, just this train trip that she made to the far north, that was by train and by boat, um, it's astounding. I mean, her endurance, and she never complains. Did anybody ever comment, like Beatrice Webb <coughs> writes about, you know, how she's attractive, but nasty, but, but did anybody ever comment on her disability? I mean, is it no. something she, she hid? No, and I can't tell if she walked with a pronounced limp or anything like that, but she obviously, uh, I said she was tough as nails. And uh, it didn't slow her down or stop her from doing anything. Uh, it's also an odd thing to think that uh, Walter Durante also was an amputee. He had a, his right, a part of his right leg was uh, amputated from the knee down from a train accident. Uh, so who knows, maybe that had something to do with him hiring her. Yeah. Yes? So your, the title is The Story of a Hero. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I hear a story of a kind of like high-risk journalist that travels is there a cause that you think that she is the hero of? Oh, certainly. I think that, that, first of all, she's an inspiration for journalists. That, that uh, you have to tell right the truth. You have to, you have, you know. And she worked under very challenging circumstances, working in totalitarian regimes. We had to be careful with what you wrote. But she figured out, she, she bent when she had to, whatever, I mean, and eventually she broke with it. But uh, ultimately, I think her legacy is, is that... Uh, she was a survivor, and uh, she was principled. She, uh, you look at how the evolution of her views, she wasn't afraid to change her views and to learn her views. She wasn't this <coughs> ideological hack. Sorry, I'm going to get something to drink here. Um, 
But I think, you know, I said she's of interest to feminists, she's of interest, I think, to the Jewish community, she's of interest to the Ukrainian community, for what she wrote about the famine, she's of interest to uh, all Canadians, and that we should take pride in her because she really was an unusual figure. When you compare her to people like Pierre Van Passen or uh, Frederick Griffin, these are major journalists of the Star and the Globe and everything who went to the Soviet Union and what they wrote. <coughs> While she was in the far north and writing about the slave labor camps, um, Pierre Van Passen was there within a week or two and saying, I saw no evidence of any slave labor camps. You know? So, because they were showing him around. She was, the fact that she was able to speak Russian, she didn't need an interpreter. But the word, the, the term hero means something, that she had a personal. I mean, I don't think she saw herself as a heroine necessarily, no. Okay. I don't think she saw herself as a heroine. I just see her, she saw herself as uh, doing what she believed and uh, fulfilling her, her uh, ambition to become a journalist. And I think she's left her mark and uh, it's just a shame that she's totally been forgotten. And that when we were, we stumbled on her, we were researching at our institute, we were researching the history of Ukrainians in Canada in the interwar period and I hired a person to go through the Toronto Telegram looking for anything to do with Ukraine and he stumbled, they stumbled across a couple of articles which are obviously part of a larger series and I hired somebody else and we went through and we found all these articles in 1933 we went back to 1932 we found a whole series of articles about the trip to the far north and that was like the first sort of eye-opening thing and then I started getting into other aspects of her life and saying wow you know this woman I mean considering where she came from poor immigrant family, she's handicapped, her father dies when she's 11, she works in a factory. She had a lot of strikes against her. And she, she but she, she that, the amazing thing is, is that she doesn't complain. She doesn't, even when she talks about her situation, she's sort of frank, but it isn't whiny, it isn't, you know, self-pitying or anything, there's none of that in her. And that makes her heroic in my, my, in my eyes. Yes. <coughs> Uh, my, I'm a little bit uh, confused. Uh, like uh, he worked, she worked with Walter Duranti, and Walter Duranti, in actual fact, wrote uh, in uh, what was the paper in the New York Times. New York Times, right? And uh, in a glowing terms uh, yep. of and denied uh, the yep. famine and all these things. So how come she still thought highly of him? Well, she didn't. Know she she um, there's a reference that she makes to him in her later years, I'd have to find it. Uh, and it's more than that, she, she, didn't, she, just didn't, she didn't speak badly of him. Uh, I mean, he obviously was still a, a, an important influence on her life. He, he, he basically taught her how to write, how to be a journalist, how to structure a story, to tell a good story, and all of that. I think that's what she got from him. She didn't get his ethics, her ethics from him. And, um, but yeah, it's an interesting relationship between the two of them, and uh, hard to know exactly. Uh, Walter Duranti, this is, this is how well he knew her. Before she embarked on her trip in the car with these two women, his comment to her was, Rhea, I've already written your obituary. Don't worry, it's gonna be a good one. <laughs> that's what he thought about their chances of pulling this off. So that, that's classic, classically cynical Duranti. And Duranti was, not, Duranti was not an ideologue either. It wasn't like he was pro-Soviet or pro-communist or anything. He was just cynical and, uh, and an opportunist. He was interested in his own career and promoting himself. So. Yes. so did Ria write any articles about the plight of Ukrainian Jews or uh, German Jews? Not that I've come across. Um, she mentions, she mentions uh, running into Jews in the Soviet Union. Uh, so on this trip through the famine lands, um, she describes coming to a collective farm in southeastern Ukraine, and um, she was a bit surprised because the treasurer for the farm was this 22-year-old Odessa Jew, who obviously was way out of his league. I mean, uh, running the finances for a, uh, a big collective farm operation was was not really a <coughs> thing. Uh, she makes a, uh, she she encounters. Oh, this is this is interesting. In um, 
Birbistan, what's the what's the Jewish colony that Birbistan in in Central Asia that Stalin and, and the Soviets established as pen, essentially as a Jewish state or theoretically as a Jewish state uh, to keep Jews away from Zionism and. Uh, uh, she describes being in a village where uh, there are a bunch of Jews from the collective farm and they're selling produce and she said I hadn't seen that kind of produce in years that obviously they were being their their food supply was good and they had all kinds of surplus to sell and uh, uh, but she doesn't she doesn't dwell on, on uh, the Jewishness of any of these people um, the angry letter that she wrote to um, open letter that she wrote to uh, uh, Yagoda. Yagoda was Jewish uh, as well. I mean, that had, that didn't stop her from didn't, she didn't pull any punches. The fact that he was Jewish, he was a uh, part of the regime that, and that that she loathed. <coughs> that was the basis that she decided on. But uh, she did. Uh, we have uh, when one of her nephews sons was having his bar mitzvah here in Toronto. She uh, sent a gift of the book, this How I Got That Story, which he inscribed on his on a bar mitzvah as a gift for him. Um, so she still, you know, she had a, a sense of, and she, and in some of her border crossings, she's described as Polish, Canadian, Hebrew. <coughs> uh, she was all those things, but she was also a citizen of the world. Do you know of any other journalists that were thrown out of the Soviet Union later on in, in the 50s or 60s? Well, sure. In 1961, Mark de Villiers, some of you will remember this, who wrote for the Toronto Telegram and was their Moscow correspondent, was kicked out. And when that happened, the Telegram people went through their archives and they found the stuff about Rhea being kicked out, and they contacted her and they interviewed her. Mm -hmm. And they ran her picture with the story. And so it was a nice little reminder. And again, in, Part of the way I pieced together the kind of her life is she gave a number of interviews for articles about her uh, and there are details in them. Sometimes they don't always quite align, but they're, you know, I mean, she's speaking just off the cuff and from memory. Uh, so uh, you know, she said she was seven years in Germany. Well, she was there from uh, November of 1933 to, 19, to November of 1938. Not exactly seven years, but she was, you know, ask me, uh, you know, how many years I lived somewhere or whatever. I mean, I, these things are normal, uh, you know, to screw up. Yes? I'm just wondering, when she was in Nazi Germany, when she interviewed Stryker and was in contact with some of the other uh, high party officials, she didn't disclose that she was Jewish, did she? Well, she didn't gloat, but they would have known. They would have known. And I, that's why I think when she, when she flew out ostensibly, she, she, because in the, one of the articles of the Canadian press, he said that, she told the reporter that she was flying to England for a holiday. I have a feeling that she might have been, this is, I said, five days after Crystal Knock, that she might have said, okay, time to get out of here because it's too dangerous. Uh, she didn't, um, uh, because of the accident, so the address that, that is given for in the directory from Munich is still there in 19, or the same address in 1939. But I have a feeling it's because she was not well enough to be able to even tra travel back to Germany to grab her belongings or to shut down her apartment and move out. Uh, Larissa? Um, can you um, explain more or less how many people were working on this whole project with you? And um, can you also describe some of the highlights of your uh, your research, that that process that you took from the very beginning when the, just the embryo of the information was stumbled upon and gave you to where you are now. What was some of the highlights of the process and were there a lot of people involved? There are a lot of people involved and in my acknowledgments, uh, I, the title is It Takes a, a Village of Salah Ashtadu. Uh, because I've had lots of help. It's been absolutely inspiring how many people, because I tell people the story and people are so captivated. The next thing I know, saying, you know, and they, they find stuff, they, they send me things. They jump on board and they get. What's that? They jump on board and they just sort of start. Oh, yeah, well, I'll give you an example. This guy who uh, uh, 
contacted me a couple of years earlier about some other research. He'd seen an article that I'd written, and he was interested in the same things so from, from Oakland, California. So he writes me. Um, I sent him a bunch of stuff. He's also a freelance writer. I mean, so we identify with each other. And I just say, you know, if I make it to the Bay Area, I'll give you a call. So sure enough, I'm in Oakland speaking at a Limud conference. And I gave him a call, and he came pick me up, took me to this place. So we start talking. And I tell him, I said, what are you working on? He's working on a book in the California wine industry. What are you working on? I'm where I'm working on a biography of this woman, Rhea Kleinman. I tell him the story. I come back to Edmonton, and like four days later, he sends me a list of over 100 newspapers in the United States with the newspaper, the date, and the page number of where the articles about her expulsion appeared. It's sort of like, wow, I had a list of 30 that I'd cobbled together from various sources, but he had other sources and was able to you know, blow it wide open. Um, I got a call, I, I was asked to <coughs> contribute a piece to a journal that our institute <coughs> publishes in Ukraine, in Ukraine, in a digital journal called Ukraina Moderna. And uh, the, fa the November was coming, they wanted to do a famine issue. Uh, the woman who's the editor knew about my work on Rhea. She's a feminist herself, and she thought it was a great story. She said, you've got to write something, you've got to write something. I said, I'm not ready yet. I, there are too many, I don't know, there are too many holes in her life. I, you know, I'm just finding things out. I decided to, to do it anyway. So I wrote what I, on the basis of what I knew, and uh, it gets published. And then a few months later, I get a phone call from this guy saying, uh, or no, I got an email from this guy saying, I read your piece in the paper, Russell Working from Chicago. He says, I read your piece in Ukraine Moderna about uh, uh, Rhea Kleinman. He says, I'm really interested. Would you mind sharing me information about her? So I'm working on a novel that's set in Moscow in 1932. And I'd love to sort of, you know, work her into it somehow into the, in, in the thing. I sort of thought, no, I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm still, there's, I said, I've, I've got so many questions that I haven't answered yet. And there's so much work that still needs to be done. And I don't know if I want to sort of give him this and he's going to, already start promoting her story. And, um, but I decided to take a chance, I called him. He seemed like a, a very nice guy, an American, married to a Russian woman who he met in, while working as a um, um, Peace Corps volunteer in Kamchatka, or in the far, in the far east. Uh, they have a kid, they live in, in thing. So he learned Russian and stuff. Hell of a nice guy. So I sent him this stuff. <clears throat> Next thing I know, he sends me uh, I said, you know what? I said, he, and he used to work as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. I said, you know what? Could you get me the articles that Alva Christmas, you know, these articles, because they cost like four bucks each to buy them or whatever. And I, and I wasn't sure if they were any good or, no problem. He goes, I sends me all of those. He sends me other stuff. And then about a year ago, he says, you know what? He says, I decided it's got to be a good, it's got to be an FBI file on her. And he knows that he worked as an investigative reporter. And he, he found, he got me the FBI file, it's 18 pages long, very detailed, covers from 1942 to 1967, and um, you know, where she was living, interviews of neighbors, interviews of former employers, including the, some of them who complained that she was a difficult woman. <laughs> uh, they, um, uh, you know, he sends me all this stuff, and then he says, you know, he says, normally it can take, it can take months to get this. He says, I contacted my sources in the FBI thing, you know, the archives there and stuff. And this woman, he says, I don't know if she was Ukrainian or something. He says, I got in two days. <laughs> so people have been very, 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 very good to me. And I've got a long list of people that I have to thank. So all these little bits of information. The librarian at the University of Toronto, Ksenia Kubushinska, has been really helpful. A woman named Julia Meckenberg, who's written a fabulous book, which I highly recommend to all of you, called American... Uh, American Women in Red Russia Chasing the Soviet Dream. And um, part of it is actually talks about the, all the Jewish women who went uh, in, the, in the 30s and the 20s and 30s and whatever, and uh, does a really good job describing why they went and how their attitudes changed and how they didn't change and all of this stuff. And several of them knew, Mer knew, knew Rhea. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote to her and I said, you know, Professor Miller, did you not come across you? And I sent her my article, and she was just sort of like, wow, I never knew about her, right? And I said, well, she knew Nelly Bennett, she knew Ruth Emerson Kennel, she knew things. She gave me, then she contacted people who did research for her. She says, get a hold of this person, this person. Here's two, art, two excerpts from letters that weren't, you know, they're all hand copied it from somebody, but she sent them to me. So, no, people have been absolutely fabulous. Because I think it's just because it's such a great story. Yeah. Final question. Um, 
Would there be RCMP files on her and KGB files? Wouldn't it be called the KGB? Would it have been called the KGB in those years? OGPU. OGPU. Check off. Yeah, have you been able to get access? To I, have, I, have asked, I have asked uh, friends in Ukraine, for instance, in Kharkiv, to go through the Kharkiv archives or whatever, but she wasn't in Ukraine much. Mm -hmm. um, and the archives in Russia, good luck. Um, they're, yeah, not gonna, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to, totally, I'm not totally writing that possibility off. Uh, RCMP files, I don't know, I, I uh, haven't looked specifically. Uh, she was out of the country <coughs> so much that, I mean, there must be, there might probably be something, certainly because the Americans had all this stuff on her. Um, the Americans, what's interesting, the FBI files uh, already, very quickly, they determined that she was not a threat to national security because she didn't believe uh, in communism anymore, not co not that kind of communism. That she wasn't uh, uh, a Soviet sympathizer. Uh, why the, she was actually denied in '46 uh, uh, security clearance after she obviously had it uh, during the war. I, I there's there's one file I'm still trying to. I don't somebody copied, but they just copied the title of the file, and I, I there's nothing. In, I, I I wonder if there's something inside the file that he didn't get, so I'm gonna have to go back and look for it. But it's like a, a forensic case, you know, I got to piece together all the puzzle and the clues, so. But thank you very, very much for coming. And uh, thank you, Alex, for having us today. I want to thank uh, Robert Rothman and the synagogue for yeah. hosting this event. And uh, for those of you who are looking for a community to belong to, uh, for a synagogue, this is an amazing place. We've been here for many years, so I welcome. And uh, thank you again, Yars, for presenting this fascinating woman to us.